Birth in the City. So why is it called Serial Birth in the City? Well, the serial part of it is inspired by a series of podcasts that came out initially a few years ago, and it told one story over a number of weeks. And so that's why serial works. Birth in the City? Well, it tells the story of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem well over 2,000 years ago. So I hope you enjoy it. You'll meet lots of characters. Some of them are to be found in the Bible. Others have been made up, artistic license, and others are historical voices uh, that'll crop up from time to time. But it all builds up a picture of something, an event that was just so unusual and so peculiar and yet so world-changing that the story needs to be told and the story will be told. So I hope you enjoy this. Be immersed in it. Let your imaginations run riot as we enjoy serial Birth in the City. Episode 1. Our Friends in the North. This is a story about power. The men who have it, the men who want it, and the men who will kill to get it. It's the story of overlooked women given a powerful voice to tear down injustice and proclaim hope. It's about a boy born to be king of us all. It's a strange tale with odd characters, late night disturbances, powerful heavenly beings, and the sniff of scandal. Our story takes place in a small country that has been annexed into the Roman Empire. This empire rules most of what we call Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. Power is in hands of one family called the Caesars. Theirs is a clever and ruthless dynasty. They coined a phrase we still use today, divide and rule. Caesar Augustus is in charge of the family business at the time this story starts, and he thinks so highly of himself that he's adopted a new title, Son of God. This is how the historian Christopher Kelly has described the power of the Roman Empire. Then the empire stretched from Hadrian's Wall in drizzle-soaked northern England to the sun-baked banks of the Euphrates in Syria, from the great Rhine-Danube river system which snaked across the fertile flat lands of Europe, from the low countries to the Black Sea, to the rich plains of the North African coast and the luxuriant gash of the Nile Valley in Egypt. The empire completely circled the Mediterranean referred to by its conquerors as Mare Nostrum, our sea. And on its eastern flank are the occupied and troubled territories of Judea, Samaria and Galilee, where an ancient people bear witness to another king. Their heroes have Hebrew names, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David and Solomon, but they are now in the iron-fisted clutch of Gentiles who care nothing about their history or traditions. It's a nation divided between a few Roman sympathizers and angry grassroots movements who want revolutionary change. You can smell the tension. This is how best-selling author Reza Nasla describes Jerusalem at that time. Jerusalem at the time of the Roman invasion was home to a settled population of about 100,000 people. To the Romans, it was an inconsequential speck on the imperial map, a city the wordy statesman Cicero dismissed as a hole in the corner. But to the Jews, this was the navel of the world, the axis of the universe. There was no city more unique, more holy, more vulnerable in all the world than the Jerusalem. The purple vineyards, whose vines twisted and crawled across the level plains, 
the well-tilled fields and viridescent orchards bursting with almond and fig and olive trees, the green beds of papyrus floating lazily along the Jordan River. The Jews not only knew and deeply loved each feature of this consecrated land, they laid claim to all of it. Though in fact, the Jews ruled none of it, not even Jerusalem, where the true God was worshipped. The city that the Lord had clothed in splendor and glory and placed, as the prophet Ezekiel declared, in the center of all nations, the eternal seat of God's kingdom on earth was, at the dawn of the first century, just a minor province and a vexing one at that, at the far corner of the mighty Roman Empire. Judea had been under foreign rule for centuries. The Babylonians, then Alexander the Great, Egypt, then Antiochus the Great, and his crazy son, Antiochus Epiphanes, another one who thought he was God incarnate. However, from 164 BC to 63 BC, a powerful Jewish guerrilla movement, the Maccabees, wrested power from the infidels and restored Jewish hegemony over Judea. These were hard men, and they ruled the people with iron fists, tacked into iron gloves. These priest kings lasted for a hundred years, until two brothers, Hecanus and Aristobulus, fell out with each other and looked to Rome for support. This came in the form of Pompey Magnus, who swept into the city and made it his own. Roman rule in Jerusalem and surrounding areas began in 63 BC when Pompey Magnus entered the capital city and lay siege to the temple. My name is Pompey and I conquered Jerusalem. Many is a day I regretted my decision. The place is full of arguments and quarrels and endless debates about a god no one has ever seen. We Romans are practical people. We make things work, and generally speaking for the better. We don't care that much about religion. There are lots of gods we don't believe in. But this lot in Judea are forever banging on about their god being the only true one. Give me a break. Pompeius marks. He wins over the ruling class in Jerusalem by giving them financial sweetness, tax raising powers, and access to the imperial government. And the Romans are milking it. Through their genius for civil service and bureaucracy, the poor people of the land are caught in a web of debt and taxes. In Galilee, way up in the north, the people have taken to the streets and voiced their protests. The Galileans call themselves Zealots, but the Romans have given them another name, Terrorists. Pompey needs local help, someone on the inside who knows how to pull the levers of power. And he's found him, a clever young Jewish nobleman from, from Edumia called Herod. He wasn't born a king. So Caesar tells, sells the title to him. He is known as the King of the Jews. Herod combine, combines the fame of a celebrity, the wealth of a gangster, and the charm of a psychopath. Hi, I'm Herod. I'm terribly modest, and it's very pleasing to be remembered as Herod the Great. Not average, but great. Rome makes Herod its client king. He had no real power, only what his Roman betters give him. But the ordinary people loathe him for getting between the sheets with the Romans. He controls the populace with such savagery that Caesar Augustus jokes that he would rather be Herod's pig than his son. I was born for this. I built huge buildings and Changed the landscape of Jerusalem, markets, theatres, palaces, even ports in other parts of the country. You name it, and I built it. Am I great or what? 
Herod is in love with Greek culture, and he even forces amphitheatres, Roman baths and gymnasia on the Jews of Jerusalem. And up north, where there's trouble, he builds a new royal city called Sepphoris, only a few miles away from Nazareth. But the Revolutionary Workers' Party is having none of it. Their leader, Hezekiah the Galilean, wants to see Israel return to the purity of their faith in a land of free of the Romans. My name is Hezekiah. They call me a terrorist, but I'm a freedom fighter. We take from the rich and return the profits to the poor. We burn their houses, destroy their palaces, set fire to their theatres and torch their vineyards and olive groves. We torched Herod Sephoris and I laughed when it became a pile of ash. I can't tell you just how much we hate the Romans. It's our duty to oppose Rome by whatever means. Murder, mayhem, robbery makes no difference. All that matters is that the Romans get out and we return this nation to God's rule. Herod's revenge is swift after the torching of Sepphoris. Hezekiah is beheaded and his dismembered body paraded through the streets. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Herod is feeling great. So what if Sepphoris is burned down? Don't these stupid peasants realise I'll just raise their taxes, bleed them dry and build a bigger, better city? And I love grand buildings. I mean, look at my new temple in Jerusalem. It's taken an age to complete, but we got there in the end, with the help of some brutal supervisors, not forgetting, of course, the thousands of slave labourers trafficked from across the empire. Even if it even has a nod to our new friends. I made sure we carved a golden eagle over the main entrance, the symbol of our blessed Roman masters. <laughs> I've even hidden picked a high priest who offers two sacrifices a day on behalf of our new emperor, Caesar Augustus, who likes to call himself son of God. Son of God he may be, but he is not as great as I am, although I'd never say that to his face. Less than 10 miles away from Sephoris, is the small and desperately poor hamlet of Nazareth. Tucked away from influential people and warring factions, this place has been a farming community for centuries. But things are changing for the worse. Crippled by taxation, these peasant farmers can no longer afford to live, and most of them have gone to work as builders in Sepphoris, which is being rebuilt. <clears throat> One of these men is Joseph, son of Heli, a labourer. He is betrothed to be married to a young woman called Miriam or Mary. Looking through dreamy, pastel-tinted lenses, this is how 19th century Jewish scholar and Anglican priest, Dr. Alfred Edersheim, imagines Galilee and Nazareth at the time of this story. Climbing this steep hill, fragrant with aromatic plants and bright with the rich coloured flowers, a view almost unsurpassed opens up before us. For the Galilee of the time of Jesus was not only of the richest fertility, cultivated to the utmost and thickly covered with populous towns and villages, but the centre of every known industry and the busy road of the world's commerce. Northward, the eye would sweep over a rich plain, rest here and there on white towns, glittering in the sunlight, then quickly travel over the romantic hills and glens, which formed the scenes of Solomon's song. In the farthest distance, white sails, like wings, outspread towards the end of the world, nearer, busy ports, then centres of industry, and close by, travelled roads, all bright in the pure eastern air and rich glow of the sun. Best-selling author and screenwriter Reza Asler takes a different view. New York Times best-selling book, Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. This is how he views the Nazareth in which Jesus grew up. 
ancient Nazareth rests on the jagged brow of a windy hilltop in Lower Galilee. No more than a hundred Jewish families live in this tiny village. There are no roads, no public buildings. The villagers share a single well from which to draw fresh water. A single bath fed by a trickle of rainfall captured and stored in underground systems serves the entire population. It is a village of mostly illiterate peasants, farmers and day labourers, a place that does not exist on any map. But this ugly blemish on the landscape is home to an odd couple. Joseph, who is probably in his late 20s or early 30s, and Mary, who was barely 14. Who are you, Joseph? Uh, I'm a nobody from nowhere. Since I was born, I've had to live up to somehow being related to King David. You know, you know the, the greatest king ever. Well, that's all well and good. But when you can barely feed yourself or pay your way, what's the use of distant greatness? I've been working in Sepphoris for years as a general labourer and tradesman. The Romans have a special name for people like us. Tectons. They belong to the lowest class of peasants in the first century, just above the indigent, the beggar and slave. The Romans used the term tecton as slang for any uneducated or illiterate peasant, and Jesus was very likely both. I may be a jobbing labourer, but, but I've got royal blood flowing in my veins for all the good it's done me. Can't say it's a charmed life, although most days I'm struck by the differences between little Nazareth and the grandeur of Sepphoris. I've even been to the bars, but wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again. The sight of all that naked, flabby flesh plunging into hot and cold water makes my stomach turn at the thought of it all. Not that the Romans want to have much to do with the likes of me. They treat us like slave labour, and it's our country. Most of the men I work, I work with are, are younger than me, some a lot younger. I'm an old man to most of them. A major change is coming Joseph's way. He's engaged to a woman half his age. The last few weeks have been bonkers. I'm teased all the time about my age and my singleness. All the time I'm told that I'm past it, getting too old, you know, the sort of thing. My old mum and dad are the worst, going on and on and on about it. And then Mary comes along. We are related, which is it's a very good thing around here, and she's a woman of faith, even better. I spoke to her dad, and he agreed I could have her hand in marriage. So here I am, betrothed to the most beautiful woman in Galilee. What does betrothal mean? We turn to Dr. Edersheim for an explanation. Their relationship was sacred, as if they had already been wedded. Any breach of it would be treated as adultery, nor could the band be dissolved except, as after marriage, by regular divorce. Yet months might intervene between the betrothal and marriage. It, it was all arranged by our parents. I felt it was a good match. You would say that, wouldn't you? I'm terrified. You seem ancient to me. And here I am getting married to someone as old as my dad. Oh, come on. I'm cooler than your dad. Anyway, because I'm older, I can provide for you and hopefully be a good father to our children. We'll stay in Nazareth, have children in Nazareth, and probably die there too, like our ancestors. And then it went horribly wrong. After the betrothal ceremony, life went back to normal. Pretty dull, really. Most mornings are spent cleaning the house. Oh, so much dirt comes into our houses. With What with the harvest and the men coming back from Sepphoris, carrying that nasty city dust. I was there on my own one morning, feeling content with the future that lay ahead of me. Most of the time, whatever I'm doing, I dip in and out of prayer. And that's what I was doing that day when I knelt down to get something I dropped. I must say this again. 
I was home alone. And as I knelt down, I saw these bare feet in front of me. And I remember thinking uh, that they were clean feet, no dust or dirt. Wherever these had been, they hadn't come from these dusty streets. I shrieked and I fell back and looked up at this stranger. And he did seem strange. His features were pretty much the same as all the other men I knew. He was Jewish and not Roman, but he was tall and confident. I can't really explain, but I'll try and put it into words. He had a human body, but his movements were flowing and easy. When he spoke, it felt as though there was music or water hidden in his voice. He lifted me from the floor with such grace, but I could feel the power. As he was without age, I couldn't work out how old he was. There was no small talk. He had a message for me, and he got straight to it. Hey, Mary. How's it going? I've got really good news for you hot off heaven's press. My name is Gabriel and God has sent me to you. Of all his people, you are the most favoured. I mean, he really likes you. He loves the way you talk to him and share all your concerns. He wants you to know that he trusts you. Trusts you so much that he's going to give you a son. His son. In fact, you're already pregnant. It's a boy. And this boy is going to save the world. He's going to become king of everything. And he's on the move. Your old cousin, Elizabeth, the one who's been told she can't have children. She's pregnant too. Another boy, and her boy, is going to play a big part in your boy's life. I was gobsmacked. I couldn't speak. My voice box was paralysed. Even though I wanted to scream, laugh, sing, cry all at the same time. What do you mean I'm pregnant? <laughs> I've never been with a man, so when did that happen? I could be stoned, stoned to death for this. This story only really makes sense once you understand that the people of this time had unfinished business with their sacred writings. The Old Testament contains works of prophecy that looked forward to a time when a child would be born who would change the destiny of the Jews and also the whole world. Like these famous words from the prophet Isaiah, written about 400 years earlier, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall upon him his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over the kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord hopes will do this. Or these words from the same prophet. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of, a, of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in, on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious." And Joseph's distant ancestry suddenly comes alive in this story. His family tree goes all the way back to a small village in the south called Bethlehem. Another prophet, Micah, writing at the same time as Isaiah, says this. 
But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give him up until the time when she who is in labour has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the, na the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. In that moment, after the fear had passed, I felt immense, deep down peace. I didn't understand any of it, but I knew that God had touched my life. I also knew I was in trouble and managed to persuade Joseph to let me go and see my cousin Elizabeth, who lives down south in the hills around Jerusalem. It was a big deal as I had to stay with, with relatives on the way. And I started wondering if I'd made it all up, some horrible vision. By the time I arrived in their swanky house in the hills, I had more or less concluded that I had made it all up. Elizabeth was so excited to see me and she wanted to share her news that she was pregnant. She can be very excitable. But she told me that as soon as she saw me, the baby in her womb gave an enormous kick. And she started prophesying and praying and singing. And then I got it. I felt full of God's love and power and sang this amazing song about God's mercy for small people. Oh, we were laughing and full of joy. Like we'd had a lot of wine, but we were sober. Elizabeth's story was weird too. Her husband, Zechariah, a top priest in the temple, had been struck dumb by an angel when he was on his own in the temple. This angel had been telling him that he was to be the father, and Zechariah more or less laughed at him. <laughs> and the poor man hadn't spoken since. <laughs> Never laugh at an angel, I thought. Don't make them angry. And guess what? The visitor's name was Gabriel. Oh, and I sang a song. No, God gave me a song and I haven't stopped singing it since. It's a song of freedom for me and for all of us. That's where we leave them. 
60 miles north in Nazareth is a restless Joseph, worrying about how he will provide for his new bride. He's in for a bigger shock soon. In Rome, Caesar Augustus wants more money from his Judean subjects, and he commands his governor in Syria, Quirinius, to make a census of the population. He thinks he's being fleeced by clever pleasants, and he wants to know who's who. Everyone will be forced back to the place where they came from, and then they will be counted. For a moment in history, the entire troublesome population will be frozen for the bead counters to start counting. And Mary's belly is getting bigger by the day. Soon people will realize she's pregnant. But who's the father? Find out more in episode two, Serial, Birth in the City.